2014, where he won what percent? Five percent. Five percent of the vote. Yeah. There you go. And we're going to be talking today about um, how to build the Green Party into a mass membership organization. And that's what it's about. So we get started, Howie, and... Yeah, so um, Bruce is the technician. He, he put this on a PowerPoint. We have an outline that at some point we'll make available as soon as we get a few corrections and... Oh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 that's another thing. I should... Um, you want to do a sign Yeah, sheet? yeah, I got... We should do this. I'll pass this around. And um, what we will do is anybody who gives me a name and an email address, uh, we will send you a copy of the outline and some other related materials. So you want to pass that around. Please print the name so we can read. Please print the name and print the email so it can be read. Thank you. So that's the first lesson. We're taking names. You know, you can't just do social media and just throw it out there. You've got to find out who your supporters are, who you can recruit to the party. you got to know your base in your neighborhood, in your city, uh, in your union, you know, wherever you're organizing. So Bruce just demonstrated one of the first things we got to do. But uh, we want to talk about the Green Party, and we've got a problem. Um, we used to be a party of local chapters, people paid dues, we are represented nationally, proportion to the membership. And in the 90s, state parties started getting ballot lines, and they said, hey, in California, we got 100,000 registered members and only 500 paid members. We should have more power in the national party. And it became this big struggle over whether we're going to represent actual living, breathing people who supported the party or virtually represent people who told the state they're in the party, no matter what their politics. And I'm not going to go into the history of how that fight went on throughout the 90s, but in the end, we ended up with the same model as the Democrats and Republicans, uh, uh, enrollment parties where power structure is dictated by state law. And uh, the problem is we lost our funding base and we lost our grassroots organized base. So we defunded and disorganized ourselves. And Bruce and I believe the solution is that we need to go back to that other model. And we're going to go over the history of parties, how they developed, how this mass membership party is an invention of the left. It was how they competed with the top-down uh, parties that were the first parties as parliamentary systems or legislative systems developed. And uh, talk about the things the solution can do, the dues financing. And the idea that the little people won't make little contributions and fund a mass movement, the Bernie Sanders campaign disproved that, two and a half million contributors what did they raise, 150 million or more? 200. 200 million, okay. So uh, the idea that we can't fund it uh, with the little people, I think, has been disproven. Uh, we believe the solution enables mass participation. We talk about grassroots democracy, but if you can't go to your local Green Party meeting and talk about what's an issue we got to address, how we organize a campaign, what our position should be on something, who our leaders should be, even if our leaders are not representing us, how we replace them. Uh, you, you don't go to your local Democratic committee to decide how we're going to fight for a $15 minimum wage in the city or how we're going to fight TPP. You go to the old party committees basically to get network. You want a job with the city public department, department of public works. You want a contract from the mayor. You know, you start paying your dues in the party committees, which just mobilize people. They are not what we think of when we have a green local meeting where you know we talk about issues and how we're going to organize. So if we're going to have a mass party, we've got to have a way for the masses to get engaged. Um, we think one of the missions of a party should be to unite us, the people, the working people. We're divided by race, obviously. We have increasing geographic race and class segregation in this country over the last four decades. And within the working class, we're divided between union and non-union. The non-union kind of resent the union benefits that the union organized people got. It's big and small business, different kind of work. You work alongside your boss in a small business, you got a different mentality than if you're working for a big corporation in a, in a management hierarchy. Um, you've got public workers and private workers. Public workers generally, although these were they're losing this, have defined benefit contributions. Private workers tend to have been moved over to the defined contribution, formal 401k program. So 
private workers resent the public workers. So we got those divisions. Then we got all these people in the prison system and the welfare system who are working class. And you got some working class people that are sitting on the other side of the bars watching them or the other side of the desk, you know, dealing with their benefits. And so we need a place where people can come around in a city across these divisions and find their common interests. And this is not going to happen uh, by, you know, social media saying let's treat each other with respect or deal with our white supremacy or whatever. We got to get down face to face and hammer out, you know, and find out what our common interests are. That's something that a party needs to do. Um, okay, and Bruce, gonna, you go. I'm, I'm going to say we need to stick to the script because what you're saying is in there. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm, I'm giving the summary first. Okay. All right. And uh, it's going. We're talking about our party should be involved in building social movements, not just joining them. And Bruce is going to talk more about that later because the, the nonprofit industrial complexes with the big money behind it is kind of mm -hmm. dictating our agenda. And finally, it should be a place where we do political education. So I should be looking up here, right, instead of my own outline. Okay. So it's close. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think I covered this slide. So. Yeah, you did. The Green Party is uh, like, are we a fit home for the thousands of folks who are looking for a political home right now? Anybody thinks we are? Ideologically, I would yes. Say, ideologically, well, yes. Ideologically, but if if in your state, 200 people walked in the door tomorrow, or 300 walked in the door tomorrow, mm -hmm. could you handle that mm -hmm. administratively mm -hmm. or any no. other way? No. You couldn't do it. And who thinks there aren't 300 people in California, or Illinois, or Pennsylvania, or Georgia? There are. I guarantee you there are. So we can't handle it. Anyway, why can't we handle it? Because we're too weak to compete, we're underfunded and understaffed, we're unable to communicate, like how we just said, and why? Okay. We're too weak to compete because we're imitating the organizing model of Republicans and Democrats. Democrats and Republicans both use 1% of money and corporate media to communicate with their followings and to lead a mass following. And their candidates and their campaigns are completely independent of and completely not responsible to their local party organizations or their voters. Look at Donald Trump. How did he get the nomination? Money. He bypassed, no, no, not money. Advertising. He bypassed all the local Republican organizations, all right, and he used his reality star cachet mm -hmm. and lots of free media that they gave him mm -hmm. for no good reason, and he, and he won the primaries. Bernie. Bernie demonstrated his independence from his base, too, by uncritically embracing Hillary, despite the, you know, what a lot of his followers wanted. There you go. The Green Party has been following their model, only without the money and without the media. Mm -hmm. How's that working? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was quiet, but he wrote most of this shit, okay? <laughs> like I said, I just put it in, in the PowerPoint here. Why is the Green Party in this state? Again, because we're imitating their model, and we just covered that. Um, oh, yeah. Also, we said we're imitating their model? The Jill Stein campaign. I've been working for the Jill Stein campaign. The Jill Stein campaign has five or six times the number of employees and many times the budget of the National Green Party. Mm -hmm. There you go. And that's true with the Democratic and Republican parties. Um, they are not only capitalist ideologically, they are capitalist as an institution mm -hmm. because the real power structure of the Democratic Party are not the formal committees. Like I said, that's where you go to network, you know, to get a job or a contract. Um, the real power structure are the campaign organizations. Each candidate is an entrepreneur. They hire some people to yeah, they form a little company, and then they seek the investors. And who, the, you know, the fat, the big money, the fat cats invest in these different campaigns, and largely determine who comes out on top. And so that's the real dynamic there. Now, in the Greens, it's a little different in that we don't accept the corporate money, but we have people who, you know, basically professional class people who got more time and discretion over their time and more money 
and they tend to dominate in our politics in the informal structure we've got. And one of the things we're talking about, this mass membership structure, is not only the grassroots members supporting it financially, but having a way to hold the whole organization accountable to them at the base. So that's where the Greens are a little bit different than the Democrats and Republicans, but the problem is our formal structures aren't really providing the leadership and the accountability. It's the initiative of candidates. And I, when I ran for governor, I raised $200,000. The state budget of our party is around $20,000. So <laughs> that, there you go. And the Greens national budget, yeah. Yeah. after we pay $100,000 for fundraising, we have about $200,000 to spend. You know, that's the size of a basically underfunded nonprofit in the hood. You know, it's, it's not, and we're trying to be a national party. So that's why we're saying we need to look to a different model. So where's the money going to come from? Where? Dues. Come on. What do people pay in church? Tithes. Tithes. Well, they call it tithes, but it's still dues, isn't it? What's the difference? Okay. Dues give us, oh, yeah, dues give us the financial resources we need. Uh, the Sanders campaign is only the most recent example that the money is out there. It's also proved by the existence of tens of thousands of churches, small and large, that run off the tithes of willing believers who are often the poor. So if people are willing, if they buy what you're doing, they'll contribute. Dues give us, oh, dues give us the financial resources we need. Oh, we already said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the part I was covering. You said I was okay, on the right. script. Yeah. I, was, I was just ahead of you. <laughs> Clearly, way ahead of us. Um, the other thing is that locals, um, underneath the national and underneath the state, um, you know, I mean, you can organize by counties, but, you know, whatever you want to call it. You know, you know but Georgia, where I live, has, what, 112 counties? Is that right? Uh, 159. 159 counties. Uh, a couple of counties have a population of 2,000. Mm -hmm. The county I live in has a population of 700,000. And there's one county floating with a million and, wow. and three more counties with 800,000. So, you know, so, so if you're organizing by counties, then are you going to give the 2,000 people the same voice as the million people? I don't know if you want to do that. Uh, but locals do enable mass participation. Locals are where your grassroots people can be active in the party. And again, if the party's not active, who's going to pay dues? And questions, we'll, do, we'll, we'll have a good period for questions at the end. Uh, locals give us the grassroots organization for grassroots democracy. They're training grounds. Locals make possible, active locals make possible the accountability of party officials on every level and accountability of <coughs> campaigns and candidates, mm -hmm. which are not accountable often. Party locals are where we can begin to unify the working class by <coughs> building relationships and solidarity. Solidarity across the lines of race, geography, solidarity across occupational divisions. How is way ahead of us, isn't he? I, I told you he wrote this stuff so we could spill it out. You know? um, solidarity of uh, uh, big business employees versus small business employees, private sector versus public sector. I mean, what's the difference between a private sector worker and a public sector worker? What's on the government payroll? Just who signs the paycheck, that's it. <laughs> That's, That's it. The only way they want you to think different is so they can get you one at a time. Um, and of course, the difference of solidarity between and among uh, folks who work in the welfare and prison systems and folks who are in the welfare and prison systems. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what state you're from, but in Georgia, uh, a prison guard is a sub-minimum wage job. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> That's how that's how the cell phones get in there. Okay, they got to make some side money some kind of way, you know. Come on. Um, hey, um, party locals are where we can build social movements, not controlled by the whims of corporate found funders. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And where did the nonprofit thing come from? Okay, some of you have read history uh, from back in the. 20s, 30s, and 40s? Did they have nonprofit organizations no. and single issue organizations back then? No. Heavens no. That is, those things are an invention 
of the funders from the late 50s, early 60s, post-civil rights era, 60s, 70s, that's where it came from. Hey, brother, can you do us a favor and get three or four more chairs from somewhere? We, can, we got space back there for them. Please, if you can get just three or four more. Um, okay, yeah, before the 1960s, the rise of the nonprofit industrial conflict, social movements were not built by single issue organizations competing for grants. They were built by self-funding, dues-paying parties by labor unions and by farmers' alliances. In the latter half of the 19th century, the labor unions and farmers' alliances organized parties. In the first half of the 20th century, left parties organized unions, consumer rights, peace and civil rights campaigns. Bang. Party locals are where we can conduct political education. We want to change the world, okay? Would you trust a doctor who hadn't studied the human body? Hell no. Okay, would you trust a dentist who hadn't studied mouths and teeth? Why should we trust a party whose members don't study how parties are put together and how societies are put together? Who don't talk about it? Do Democrats do political education? Yeah, it's called the TV. Sure they do. It's called CNN and MSNBC. Republicans do it on Fox. And some of it happens in your school, too. Yeah. Um, Political education and study groups, forums about social problems, the systems and the power structure. I live in Atlanta. Atlanta's a fairly big city. Metro is like five million people. When, when interesting folks like Howie or somebody come through town, is there a place where, where we can say, oh, who's going to be in town this two weeks? Howie's going to be in town, and um, after that, uh, two weeks later, Cornell West is going to be here. Where is the place where we can take them to have them speak and draw an audience that people are used to coming to? Mm -hmm. You know where? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But if we had a dues-paying party, self-enhancing party, we'd have a stable place to meet. We'd have a hall we could call on where we wouldn't have to labor under the stuff that you do when you get somebody's church and they say, well, you know what? You can use the hall here, but you can't talk about politics. You can't talk about running for office. You can in my church. And you, well, some churches you can, but many you can't. Okay, and some other places you can, many, and you can't, and, and you can't collect any money. But you gotta pay us for the hall. Mm -hmm. But you can't collect any money. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> political education, we're talking about political education about what our policy platform of socialism ought to be. Political education about how to organize and maintain party bodies. We'll talk more about that. Issue campaigns, electoral campaigns, and more. Whoa, did I skip something? Yes, I did. There we go. Hey, a brief history of political. I'm going to turn this over to Howie. Howie, Howie did. Howie's got big shovels, and he apparently dug all this stuff up here. So, deal. Well, uh, there's a lot of information in the outline, and I'm not going to go over it in detail, but historically, Parties came from the top down. You, we had representative bodies back to even the Romans, the Roman Senate, you know, and they had factions. They had the patricians representing the landed elite, the nobles, and the plebeians representing basically the merchants and uh, the middle class. And then they kind of disappeared until we started getting representative assemblies starting in England, the English Civil War, English Revolution. Uh, different classes started fighting for. Uh, who would have the power? So the parliamentarians or the roundheads opposed to the royalists or the cavaliers in England uh, in the Civil War and by the time the revolution in 1688 came out, the pro-parliament Whigs were fighting the pro-monarchist Tories. And that was the beginning of parties. And in the United States it came from the legislative caucuses, the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians. And the Hamiltonians were tended to be pro-England, pro-monarchy, the Jeffersonians, pro-revolutionary France, pro-democracy, except when the Haitian Revolution happened, they weren't for that, you know, because a lot of them were planters and slave owners. So a lot of contradictions there, but basically that was a first party system, it came from the top down, nominees were appointed by these legislative caucuses, but as Republican ideals spread amongst the people, they were demanding we shouldn't have a property qualification on the vote, we should all vote. And uh, so in the Jacksonian era, which was the second party system, 
They got rid of the property qualifications. And then an American invention was a convention. What we're doing today was invented by a third party, um, which was the, uh, I think it was the anti-Mason party up in New York um, in 1830. And, uh, and then the platform started coming in in uh, the same period. It was third parties that kind of raised it at that period. And so the Hamiltonians disappeared, the Federalists who, you know, were kind of anti-democratic, and you had, you know, the Whigs and the Democrats, and that was the next party system. Next party system was growing out of the Liberty Party, abolition, which evolved in a free soil party, which was free labor, uh, free men, free labor, free soil, and free speech. And that became the Free Soil Party and then the Republican Party. And so by the mid-50s, 54 election, no, 56 election, 58 election, the Republicans established them as the second party in Congress. And then Lincoln was actually a second party candidate, not a third party candidate, in a four-way race. And that led to the Democratic and Republican system, which has evolved with different dominant coalitions. Um, but in that period, third parties were very important. Uh, not just the Liberty Free Soil Republican effort, but after that, the farmer labor populist parties. They defined, as did the abolitionist parties, the issues that were debated in their time and elected thousands of people from local state to Congress and senators, governors. Uh, they were called first the Greenback Labor Party, then the Anti-Monopoly Party, then the Union Labor Party, and finally the People's Party. And they fought for civil rights. They fought to reestablish reconstruction. General Weaver, everybody knows he was the uh, People's Party candidate in 1892 and got 6 7% of the vote. But in, he was the Greenback Labor Party in 1880. And he was running around the South under armed protection to make sure the Klan didn't break up meetings, which they insisted be open to everybody, black and white. And uh, so they were fighting the imposition of what became Jim Crow. That was a 20-year fight in which third parties, uh, in a contradictory way, but definitely were fighting the imposition of Jim Crow and the disenfranchisement of black people and also poor people in the South. Because when they put a poll tax or a literacy test, it not only affected black folks, it affected poor white folks. But that was uh, another party system. And then they evolved. The New Deal coalition broke up, started in the 30s, broke up in the 80s. And then we have two very conservative parties since that time, um, and you can call it neoliberalism or the imposition of austerity. But the point is, the party systems change, and today, you know, uh, Glenn Ford at Black Agenda Report, a guy named uh, Michael Lynn, who's with one of these think tanks, people are looking at what's going on now where you have a rebellion from below of the, the voting base against the elites controlling both parties which have imposed austerity on the working people and got us involved in a bunch of damn wars that people really don't want to be involved in. So the, the party system may be breaking up right now. You've got the corporate militarists, definitely got the Democratic Party with Clinton. you got the Sandinistas who really don't, there's a contradiction there. And we're the party where they ought to be. And we're getting some indication people are coming to us. So that's the Democratic coalition splitting between progressives and the, you know, the corporate militarist elites. And then on the Republican side, there's three factions fighting for the Republican brand. You've got the old Republican, the country club Republicans, the Wall Street Republicans, the corporate militarists, pretty much like Clinton. Some of them are supporting Clinton this time because they can't stand Trump. Uh, they're, they're trying to hold on. And then you've got the Trumpists. Now, Trump is, Trumpism to me is whatever's good for Donald Trump. I mean, I don't think he stands for anything but himself. But the basis said, we don't want our Social Security. We don't want entitlement reform. We don't want our Social Security cut. We earn those benefits. And we don't like these foreign wars. And we don't like what you Republican elites have been doing. We're down really mobile. This is, you know, white working class and middle class folks. Our life expectancy is going down. So we got issues. And so we're voting for this guy that seems to be thumbing his nose at the establishment. Um, so that's the Trump faction, the populist faction. And then you've got two Republicans running on the Libertarian ticket, two mm -hmm. former Republican governors yeah. who are trying to represent sort of the moderate Republican, socially liberal, uh, an older type of Republicanism that's pretty much been pushed out of the party but still exists. So it's very interesting. But what does that mean for us? Like Bruce was saying earlier, there are, we, are, we could be flooded. And are we organized enough? Do we have the resources? to respond to these people who expect when they say, I want to help, for somebody to get back to them and help them help. 
Mm -hmm. And so that's why we need to think about how we're structured. Um, so the other part of the history, you want me to go into the different uh, party structures, you know, the... Yeah, okay, yeah, we're half, what, what, what do we got, 75 minutes? Yeah, I'll just give it a summary yeah, we can so do a people get a version sense of, yeah, sure, of what's, why not? where we've gone. So the legislative caucus system was top down. I talked about that. So you came with the open convention system as a response. So these third parties and eventually the Democrats and Republicans, when it's time to, in the, this is 1830s, 40s, 50s, in the 19th century, when they want to have a national convention, and when a third party wants to start a third party, they say, everybody interested in this, come to the precinct caucus, and we're going to elect delegates to the county convention, and the county convention will elect delegates to the state convention, and the state to the national. More democratic than the top-down legislative caucus system, but the problem is when the doors are open to whoever wants to show up, and there's no uh, commitment to the party, and say, financially in terms of dues, or agreement with a set of political principles, uh, you can get a situation where, and this happened in the 1890s with the People's Party, in 96 they ended up cross-endorsing the Democrat. The, the populist delegates from areas where the Farmers Alliances were organized, they tended to be for, we're going to run our own candidate. But in the areas where they were not well organized, uh, you had opportunists from the major parties showing up. Republicans in the South, Democrats in the North, and they wanted to do fusion coalition with the populace in order to get elected. And that wreaked havoc in terms of the state people's party and before that greenback labor and union labor. Yeah, uh, when you're when you don't have a party, when you're relegated to having the nonprofits lead the movement, I was at a meeting in North Carolina. Where's Michael at? I was at a meeting in North Carolina where they were championing fusion. They, I mean they there was a room full of people, 75, 80 people. Joe was there. Uh, and they were saying, the way to go is, what's the word? Fusion is the way to go. And so, yeah, and confusion <laughs> led to confusion in the, in the 19th century. And eventually, when they crossed endorsed William Jennings Bryan, that was the end of those, that whole series of farmer labor populist parties. Um, and the, the re you see what the reason is, is that anybody could show up. And they came here with different agendas, so you couldn't really control what was going on. And I just want to read a quote from Lawrence Goodwin, who, you know, is one of the foremost uh, uh, historians of populism. And he said, uh, in the populist moment, in democratic terms, the structural weakness of the People's Party evolved from the failure of its organizers in the founding convention in 1892 to understand that the third party, to be authentically democratic, had to be organized as a mass party with a mass membership. Instead, it was organized, like all large American parties before and after, as a representative party with elite cadres of party regulars dominating the organizational machinery from precinct to national convention. The People's Party spoke rather more tellingly than most American parties have ever done in the name of the people. But in structural terms, the, people party was, the People's Party was not made up of the people. It compromised. It was comprised of party elites. Its ultimate failure, therefore, was conceptual, a failure at the theoretical level of democratic analysis. Here's the quote. So uh, you see what he's saying. They had these farmers' alliances. They had between the Colored Farmers' Alliance and Cooperative Union in the South, uh, the White Farmers' Alliance in the South, the Northern Farmers' Alliance. They had 7.2 million dues-paying farmers, uh, agricultural workers, and allied industrial workers, the remnants of the Knights of Labor and so forth, pay and dues. And instead of saying, you had, instead of delegating from those local organizations to their conventions, they said, we're going to open up a parallel structure. Anybody who wants to show up, show up. So these opportunistic Democrats and Republicans and eventually diluted the populist program and their political independence. Now, the other thing that was going on with this open convention system was party bosses, urban machines. Mm -hmm. And the reason we ended up going to primaries, the progressive movement said, we got these bosses. And so when they call the uh, precinct caucus in the machine area, you know, you got thugs sometimes saying, you're in because you're with us, you're not because you might not be, and basically the boss is controlled from the top down. And in the end, the smoke-filled rooms, you know, decided who the nominees would be. So the progressive movement said, oh, we're going to do the primary system uh, as a way of getting out of the smoke-filled rooms. But they were also aimed at the Socialist Party who kept democratic conventions. You had to be a member to go to their conventions. 
and they were taking over cities. So the progressives was, you know, in the popular rhetoric, it was going after these machine bosses, but it was also going after the Socialist Party. So from uh, 1900 to 1920, it's primary spread across the states. So what have you got there? You know, it's not only more democratic, but in fact, remember that party structure I talked about, the candidate organizations with the capitalist money invested in them? They pre-select who the people get to vote for when they get to the primary ballot. And in the meantime, the people are atomized, they're not organized, they're not discussing among themselves what our program is and who the candidate should be to represent us. They just show up at the primary and they've been advertised at by the mass media. Today it's TV, back then it was newspapers. And uh, so it was supposed to be more democratic. In fact, it was just a more sophisticated way of having the open convention system with party bosses controlling. Now the socialists at the time, they set up a membership organization. Your state party was recognized when you had an X number of locals. It's in the notes here somewhere. There it um, is, yeah. Uh, the socialist party developed a different yeah. structure. Democratic yeah. membership convention. And they drew, they drew two lessons from the People's Party. First, uh, their party constitution said we're not going to fuse with Democrats and Republicans because that killed the populace. Now, they put it right in their constitution. Secondly, uh, only members who pay dues can vote in party decisions. They decided living, breathing members who are committed to the party enough to give a small donation every year are the ones that are going to make the decisions, not whoever shows up. And one of the things, if you've been involved in movements, when things are exciting, all kinds of people flood up and it's like, some people think, well, it hasn't worked because I've been here, but now i got all the solutions. You know? And then they, and they, they create chaos and pose decisions, and then they flood out when the movement you know, uh, uh, wanes, and the people that are committed there for the long haul are left with their decisions. So, Second, only members who right. pay dues, like you said, can vote mm -hmm. on party conventions, because you don't want to be flooded by folks who are going to leave tomorrow and not have any stake. So, right, here we go. These are ten, their state parties. You had to have at least 10 locals with five members or 200 members total. This is their 1917 constitution. And their per capita dues, the way they did it was a state party pays a per capita for the members. So you, you sign a, national, a membership form, send it to the national office, and then the state party pays your per capita, kind of like the AFL CIO for those of you in the labor movement. Um, and it was about $10 in today's dollars that the state parties paid to the national for every movement. So uh, we got some numbers, I think. Do we put them in later? That, that would explain how much money that would raise for us. Um, so the socialists maintain the system alongside the primary system. Um, the state election laws mainly are concerned with who gets to vote in the primary. So the socialists, I wish I could flip it to the next page, but I'll read the quote. Um, they said, uh, in criticism of this primary system, he said, they said in the Socialist Call in 1914, in their eagerness, there being the progressives, in their eagerness to get the reputation for being small d Democrats, these pseudo Democrats who are running things now just want to break up political parties. In other words, atomize them, like I was talking about before. If they really wanted to have real democracy, they would pattern parties after our party. So this was a conscious debate on the left whether primaries were actually more democratic or a diversion from membership conventions where the leadership of the party, the candidates, are actually answerable to a real membership. And so, it's a debate you hear nothing about anymore. I mean, before I started looking at this uh, a few weeks ago and reading the stuff that Howie um, sent me, I never heard anybody question the primary election. Where did it come from? Everything comes from somewhere. These things come from somewhere. This is why we need locals so that thousands, tens of thousands, millions of folks can be able to hear this history and appreciate it and make their judgments knowing it. So let's give that example from New York because I think, you know, the establishment at this time saw that too. Um, so, example, New York yeah. Socialists in 1920. In 1910, there were 18 socialists elected to the New York State Assembly in New York State. And they were anti-war. Um, so in 1920, there were only five. You know, you had the Red Scare, the Palmer Raids. You know, was, Eugene Debs was running for president from jail. But they still elected five. And the, the Democrats and Republicans said, we're not seating you because you're anti-war and disloyal, if not treasonous. Uh, so they called a special election. And their districts re-elected the Socialists. And then we get to 1920, and they get re-elected again. And they are not seated. So the Judiciary Committee of Assembly says, 
All right, we got to justify this. So they did a 4,428-page report on revolutionary and subversive movements abroad and at home. And I stumbled upon this in Google. And it, they got, you want to read about the Serbian socialist movement in 1920? It's there. Sri Lanka, you know, every Latin American country, Asia, and they got New York. And here's what they said about New York, which I think is very revealing. The expression Socialist Party of America is really a misnomer for a group operating under this name is not a party. And the Socialist Party is in reality a, a membership, membership organization. organization. A distinction must be drawn at this time between members of the Socialist Party of America and the enrolled socialists. A person enrolling in the Socialist Party under the enrolling under the Socialist Party emblem on registration day in the state does not there become a, thereby become a member of the Socialist Party of America. In other you words, get the point. Yeah. In other words, the last they, the, the, the the Socialist Party was outlawed <laughs> because, in their terminology, it wasn't a party; it was an organization. They want you in parties, but they don't want you organized. There in other you go. words, enrollment parties where you show up at primary and vote for the candidates they pre-selected for you. Is to be disorganized, right. by definition. Mm -hmm. And more examples, uh, early yeah. 20th century, we, we, we can skip some of that. But it's, yeah, the basic point here is there was a bunch of third parties, Wisconsin Progressive Party, mm -hmm. Minnesota Labor Farm, Farmer Labor Party, mm -hmm. North Dakota Nonpartisan League, and several local labor and farmer labor parties. Like there was a farm labor party in Berlin, New Hampshire, a paper mill town, and way up north by Canada, half of them spoke French. The farmer labor party ran that city uh, in the 40s and 50s. So, but in the period before that, uh, you know, here's what was going on. You, the, the progressives and farmer labor rights, they had two governors, four senators, and 13 members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Unions are passing mm -hmm. resolutions for a labor party. FDR polls. National Democratic Committee polls and finds if, you know, Floyd Olson from Minnesota or Huey Long from Louisiana runs third party on a more radical program than the New Deal. And remember, the first New Deal was basically, it was fascist. You know, it was coordination between the corporations and the government. It wasn't Social Security, National Labor Relations Board, WPA. That came in response to this. Um, so Floyd Olson died of cancer. And, and so FDR would have lost in a three-way right, <laughs> race. Right. And, and maybe that's why Huey Long died suddenly. He got assassinated. <laughs> so the Democrats went all out to co-op. They used fusion in New York, American Labor Party. Socialists, the first principle of socialist politics was independence from the capitalist parties. But they said uh, FDR worked with some uh, garment labor union people and the Communist Party to set up the American Labor Party as a line where socialists could vote for FDR and then vote for their socialists further down. And it basically, over time, it, became, it went down the ballot. So pretty soon, this became a second line for the Democrats. Um, so what happened in 1936 under this popular front, the labor movement and the communists, who were pretty big at that time, 40,000 members, said, we're going into the New Deal coalition. The rationale was unite with the liberal capitalists against the fascists. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna move the Democratic Party to the left. Yeah, and they're, we're hearing that. How'd that work? You know, Clinton the liberal versus Trump the fascist. It's original. Both. Come on, these folks just thought of this. But in, the thing about the party structures is third parties were influential from the 1840s to the 1930s. Since 1936, uh, we've had very little impact on national policy yeah, because we've been it. really on the margin. The mainstream of left liberal politics, progressive politics, is. Uh, work inside the Democratic Party. When you hear the word progressive, that means the socialists are in there with the liberals following the liberals, backing the Democrats as a lesser evil to the Republicans. So why we, that's why we need dues, dues and, and hey, a grassroots organizations. If somebody isn't, I mean, I've heard, and some of you have heard arguments against a dues paying membership. Well, people aren't going to pay for a political party. Uh, you know what? Some people won't. And those are probably the people who you don't want in the room anyway. At least not at, at least not making the decisions. Mm -hmm. Not today. When they're ready, they're ready, and they'll come and they'll pay dues and they'll help out. And when they're not ready, you don't need them in the room. They can watch. They can watch. If somebody's not committed enough to contribute a modest amount to support the party, why do we want to give them power and decision-making power? 
And also, if you define your members as the people who pay dues, then there's actually a defined bunch of people for your officers to be responsible to. Mm -hmm. If you are in the Green Party right now, and you're in the Black Caucus, hey man, who are people in the Green Party in the Black Caucus responsible to exactly? Mm -hmm. You know, see? Or the, or, or the Latinx Caucus. What defined body of people are they responsible to? What defined body of people are many of your national committee members responsible to? It was like whoever came in the room that day. Seriously. Um, without clear membership standards, party organizations are subject to the problem of people flooding in. We already said that. Like the Nader campaign, making decisions without the experience of committed party members, and then leaving. And this is how the Green Party structure was changed from the original mass membership structure of dues paid membership organizing <laughs> the locals into the top-down mobilization model of the Democrats and Republicans. The Greens fought over that <clears throat> back in the late 90s. Um, Mr. OG here, you can guess what side of it he was on. There was one side that wanted a Democratic um, Party model and the other that wanted a dues paid <laughs> membership model. And there was the Nader campaign and uh, Nader decided to go to the convention of the folks who wanted to be like Democrats, and what y'all do? Yeah, yeah. They, Association of State Green Parties. They wanted to. They they said we're going to be like the big boys, Democrats and Republicans. Now forget this. Yeah. Locals and dues paying. Let the state parties take care of that. Yeah, the Democrats look. It and, works for them. It work for us. And then we had the other side saying we need to keep that structure and adapt it to being on the ballot. Um, and Nader was bigger than both factions. You know, we're fighting like cats and dogs. And, you know, Nader's over here, and, you know, he basically told us they wanted to do Spain and we're crazy. So we went to the other convention, and we said, Nader's bigger than both of us. we got to be where the Greens are. And so that's how it was resolved, you know, politically. Nader just, the irony was some of those people then turned on Nader after the backlash from 2000. Uh, in any case, it's not important how it happened. It did happen. And the question we have to ask now uh, nearly 20 years later is, are we better off with this structure? I would argue we are less well-funded. You call the national and ask for help, and they refer you to somebody who's on their contact list locally. We don't have national <laughs> organizers. And most states that need the help don't have organizers. So we're not very responsive to people that want to get involved in the Green Party. Um, and so we're less well-organized. And then at the grassroots, we had about 300 locals in uh, you know the mid 90s when this fight started happening I don't know what we got now but I don't think we got that many um, or if they are they, they're not publicizing what they're doing very well they're high they're secret and they're, they're have, underground yeah we have a lot of state parties that where all the activity is just at the state level so yeah. um, you know we're arguing for we we got to keep the Federation of State Parties like the Socialist Party had back in the 1900 to 1936 period yeah. um, but uh, We've got to, well, have a national membership standard. Are we getting, I don't want to get ahead of the outline yeah. again, but. <laughs> well, well, it's right here that dues could be submitted to the national with a significant percentage related to organized state party operations, mm -hmm. which could in turn rebate half of that to local parties. There's a number of ways we could do this. Mm -hmm. um, or states could collect dues and provide people with a per capita, like you said uh, organized labor does say 10 bucks a member like the Socialist Party does and then share the rest between the state level and local. And by the way, if you've got a stable uh, thing of organized people who are submitting dues, there's people with real means who kick in more. You know that. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin. You know that. Mm -hmm. Be dues based. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that's a stable. Well, we're about to more. be dues based in Georgia. Yeah. So let's see what's going to happen. Let's see where it goes. Dues could be a sliding scale. There, you know, I mean, we're talking about we're talking about asking for ten or fifteen a month in Georgia. I mean, come on, uh, fifteen dollars is what like three lattes, right? Mm -hmm. A month, maybe, please. Maybe two. Come on. Um, and if you can't pay that, okay, well then you can pay ten bucks, please. You know, dues could be sliding scale. Um, what kind of money could this raise? Assuming everybody's poor and pays thirty bucks a year. Ten thousand members would raise three hundred thousand. That's almost three times 
what the uh, GPUS <laughs> had in 2016. Yeah, I had the number wrong right there. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but you get the idea. 100,000 uh, members under that would raise $3 million. I would make, I would make it, um, <coughs> or what, uh, 10 bucks a month is 120 a year. Mm -hmm. So if you multiply this times and four, four 100,000 members would give you $12, 12 million. million. It should be on the next slide. Yeah, it should, it should, <laughs> it should. Um, a million members could raise a lot more. I don't know how many more. Um, at this point, we're approaching the scale of the Knights of Labor. That's a blast from the past, David, 1886. Um, a blast from somebody's past. But 30 bucks is low. ACORN was membership supported. Okay? That's one of the reasons they had to disband it, to wreck it. The National Welfare Rights Organization. And they being was the Democrats, <laughs> the Republicans oh, yeah, attacked, right. and the Democrats, Obama, my member of Congress. Went along with it. Yeah. And, and then they found out the accusations weren't true, but it was too late for eight points. Way too late. <laughs> um, 30 bucks is low. Um, anyway, this is, this is all projections. Mm -hmm. But you get the idea. You can do your own arithmetic. Everybody graduated uh, the fourth grade or fifth grade. Uh, Green Party locals. There's no necessary conflict between encouraging locals and state parties. If you're going to do this democratically, ultimately, your members of your locals would elect your state parties you know, on a one-person, one-vote basis. Um, the membership form, our membership form, this is a place where we ought to emulate the socialists. They made a lot of mistakes, but uh, it should include a pledge that the member agrees to that by signing affirms their agreement with basic party principles. We don't have nothing like that now either, do we? Mm -hmm. At least not in Georgia where I'm at. Um, and the current for representation formulas for the National Committee and National Convention are kind of complicated. Yep. They're kind of complicated. Uh, campaign strength, in-state voting strength, presidential voting strength, and the phase of the moon, and whether Libra is in <laughs> retrograde but, but or the, something. But the basic point is, the people being represented, they don't, don't even know who's representing them, or that they're being represented, right? Mm -hmm. The enrollees of a party where you keep enrollment in the state, uh, unless they're insiders and knew about how to petition or how to get appointed, depending on you know the structure of the state and the state election laws, have no idea who's representing them, how to hold them accountable. Yeah, please so sign the sign-in sheet. Those of you who have not seen the sign-in sheet, um, raise your hand so we can see who you are, and each other can see who you are. Okay, look at the person who's, okay, make sure you get to sign the sign-in sheet. We need your name printed legibly and your email printed legibly, and we will send you the outline and a link to the video of this. All right? So for a party that talks about grassroots democracy, our grassroots are detached from the leadership bodies. And, you know, they ought to be living, breathing, greens that meet. That's the grassroots base. And that should be where we elect our leadership or choose our candidates, come up with our platform. So that's why we got to not rely on just what the state regulates. All they care about is who goes to vote in primaries. That's all state election law cares about. It's the main thing it cares about. So in... Uh, closed primary states that keep party enrollments. In open primary states where you can choose which party you're going to vote in on election day, like Vermont, they don't even keep the enrollment. I think 23 states are like that. Yeah, we and have so, to finish talking uh, at half past so we can have adequate time for okay. the Q&A. Okay, so uh, the point being, you know, that's why Bernie Sanders, he can say he's a Democrat when he wants to run for president, but in Vermont they don't even know what he is because they don't keep a list. <laughs> um, so, but that's all state election law cares about. Yeah. And sometimes they set up party structures. But let me get to the legality question. You want to do that yeah. now? Uh, why not? Okay, well, I got to find it. Uh, hmm. Well, yeah, let's let's stick to the script because that way we we will get it if okay. we just rush through. We will get to it. Uh, Green party locals, however you define them. Um, okay, and the national should have standards for locals that locals have to meet. Uh, locals must have regular meetings and activities. The locals have to be where the social movement takes place. The social movement is way too important to be left to the whims of the funders of nonprofits. Right now, right now, um, in your state, 
if you go, if your Green Party is not leading the social movement in your neighborhood, and you, you'll wind up having to go to somebody, go to somebody else's meeting, the meeting is run by a nonprofit person. They'll look at you over there as the Green Party, and they'll, in their imagination, you are just another single issue organization whose issue is electing people. How messed up is that? Okay? How messed up is that? But that's real. Local leadership in rank and file must be aware of, and we have to constantly make other people aware of the difference between us and the nonprofits. Okay, between uh, our internally democratic and accountable leadership model and the leadership models that the nonprofits put out. Nonprofit leaders are always either self elected, self perpetuating boards, or selected directly or indirectly by their funders and detached from the constituency that they supposedly serve. And through the locals, the internally democratic Green Party really has to contend for leadership of the social movement with the nonprofits. If we're not doing that, then they're going to eat our lunch. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be irrelevant, or, we're, or, or we'll continue to be marginally irrelevant. People rise up on their own accord when they're insulted and outraged enough. But when the outrage dies back, who comes in? Yeah, they got staff. They're funded. You're not. Okay? So the churches and the nonprofit, often the same people, are the only players on the scene with any state power. Active staff people from active locals and active green parties can bring real support to initiate to existing movements or they can initiate them. We can't do that now. We can't. I mean, the Green Party, um, I'm in Georgia. The prisoners go on strike. They call us and ask us, what the hell can we do? Well, you know what? We don't have enough people to return. To, to even, uh, we don't even have enough money to accept all the collect phone calls from prison that we got after the prison strike, let alone to help these people. Come on. Um, Green Party locals also, to keep people sufficiently engaged enough to pay the dues to take part, they're going to have to emulate the example of the church. People don't join a church because they agree with the doctrine. Half of them don't know the doctrine. That's why they go to Bible study, and they still don't understand after they go out from Bible study. They don't, they don't, you know, come on. They join because it's got activities for the kids. They got camps. They got tutoring. Okay, they got services for the elders. All right, they, got, they join because it's wraparound community. And if you're paying dues, if you got staff, you can try to be wraparound community. The old CP used to have summer camps and stuff like that. The old CP newspaper used to have, as Howard just said a few minutes ago, one of the best high school sports pages around because people actually read the sports pages. And then after they read the sports pages, maybe they can turn to the front page of the Daily Worker and get some other kind of input, you know? Um, Green Party locals, uh, have to have paid organizers who can make sure the party's responsible to member needs and teach them this stuff, how to conduct meetings, how to recruit, how to hold public forums, how to conduct political education, how to participate in or initiate issue-based campaigns, how to actively, not passively, leaflet. How many times have you took people out to leaflet and they're like, mm -hmm. you know, or, or table, and they're like sitting at the table like waiting for somebody to come up to them and ask them, why are you sitting here? You know, hey, how you do that? <laughs> yeah. Please. Yeah. But, but, but folks have to be taught. People are teachable. And they're there because they want to do something. you got to teach. And you got to make it your mission to do this. Locals have to do that. Locals can teach people how to write election or issue-based campaign plans, how to raise money, petition, how to canvas, how to keep databases, how to communicate regularly how to build relationships and solidarity with communities and frontline communities, as, as we call them in, in this campaign. Um, the objections, some people say dues are illegal. You said legal, so we got Yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> um, just to sort of segue from the movement question, you know, one of the issues we face is, and the foundation funders behind these movements like this, single issue likes. We don't, we're, the, it, different issues, different constituencies are competing for the money. And, you know, I, in my life, I've followed, I've been involved in movements, and then some people kind of get, they want to be on staff, and then they change the issue they're working on depending on what the fashion the foundations are. So anti-nuclear power became anti-nuclear weapons, became Central America, became anti-apartheid, 
And the same people are moving around, leaving the old organization with the issue not resolved without funding and support. And the old movement dies. And you really want to understand how the nonprofit industrial complex works. There's a book by Robert Allen, came out in 68 or 69, called Black Awakening in Capitalist America. Robert Allen was writing for the National Guardian, a radical paper back then. And he talks about how the Ford Foundation, very systematically, Mac George Bundy, they said, we're not going to fund SNCC, we're going to fund some, we're going to fund CORE, and we're going to push up black capitalist ideology, and CORE's people said, okay, we're black capitalists, give us the money. And he traces this, and it's a blueprint for what you can see with every progressive movement since. Now, as Bruce said, before the 60s, it was uh, farmers' alliances back in the 1800s, unions, and political parties on the left that would organize the fight of tenant farmers or tenants getting ex, uh, ex, uh, what do you call it evicted in their in cities. Uh, you know the CIO, the left parties who are fighting each other like cats and dogs, Trotskyists, Stalinists, right. the old socialists. But you know in different cities those parties were actually very important in getting the unions organized. And what they could do as parties is relate the issues. So. I think that's part of that discussion. Now, when we had the battle in the 90s, people were saying, oh, dues are illegal. If we're going to be a real political party, dues are a poll tax. Uh, the legality question. There's this case, March Fong Yu, who was the Attorney General of California, versus San Francisco County Democratic Central Committee. And that was just the first committee. A bunch of Republican, Libertarian, and Democratic committees sued because California Attorney, oh, don't flip yet. Oh, I went forward. Uh, There you go. There. Okay. Uh, sued, saying the, the most contentious issue was whether the committees, when they designated a candidate, could support the candidate in a primary. This California law says uh, the constituted committees can't take sides in a party primary. So they said it's our right as a party to back who we want. You know, if use the example uh, David Duke wants to run for Senate in Louisiana, should the Republican Party have the right to say we're going to run somebody against them in a primary and support that person? That's what the parties were talking about. There was also a provision in the state law that said central committees, it wasn't that dues were illegal, it's that if you're on a state central committee, you have to pay X amount of dues so the parties have some money. That was in the state election law. The party said, uh, you can't tell us to pay dues or not to pay dues. We can set our own dues as we want. This was a Supreme Court decision that gave the parties these rights under the rights of free association and free speech in the First and Fourteenth Amendments. That's the ultimate law in this question. And since then, the Supreme Court has backed up party rights cases. So um, if somebody tells you dues are illegal, the only thing really we can't do is say who can vote in the primaries. That the election law, there's a compelling state interest. The courts have backed that up. But if we want to say only dues paying members can uh, designate in our party committees for so candidates, uh, elect representatives to state and national conventions or committees, we can do that. It's been done. The Libertarian Party has done it for 20 years. The Socialist Party, now very small, but back in the, they did it under the primary system, which we have now in the you know, early part of the 20th century, and they still do it. So the legal question is not an issue. The other thing that comes up is they're a poll tax. It will discourage the poor and working class from participating. And I've lived through this debate, and it's always the professors and the lawyers who say this, almost always. And they say, oh, the poor working people, the poor people, they can't pay. You have dues, poor people won't participate. The fact is, and we didn't put citations down, but you can Google this, and find out how much people in different income classes give to charitable and civic organizations. Mm -hmm. And the lower on the income scale, the more they give. Because right. well, Thomas Ward likes, likes to talk about how homeless people donated. Mm -hmm. And there was a little discussion in those circles. Well, he's homeless. Should we take his money? And the answer was, you know, if you don't take his money, you're denying him agency. Mm -hmm. He wants to give you this money to get this done. He wants to take part. Take his money and do what you're supposed to do. Duh. And poor people's organizations that have been effective, like ACORN, like the National Welfare Rights Organization, they wanted five dollars a month. That's sixty bucks a year. And I hear middle class. Green squealing about that amount, and the poor people are saying, because, you know, if they're working class, they might be in a union, they understand dues, uh, NACP, you know, or the church, so. This is the last slide. Yeah. So we're, we're through. 
at this point, um, we should uh, take questions, comments. How do we how do we roll that? Well, yeah. Let's let's. And can you switch the light all the way up? And we're going to be unrepresentative here and.